Welcome to Coffee and Crime, and the third installment of the six-episode deep dive into Jack the Ripper, the case that got me interested in true crime. I'll be talking about the third of his five victims, so grab yourself a cup of coffee, curl up on the couch, and get ready for some true crime. Elizabeth Stride was a prostitute, like all of Jack's victims, but unlike them, she'd endured this life at an earlier age, even before her first marriage. She'd con- contracted a few diseases, and gave birth to a stillborn child at one point. She was married for a time, but the relationship struggled, despite a reconciliation. Her husband and children died, leaving Stride with few options to earn a living. She resorted to selling her body once again, like so many other unfortunate women did. Similar to Jack's first two victims, Elizabeth was living in a common lodging home. These establishments were keen to fop houses, and modern-day hostels. She worked to earn her bed and spent many of her nights working hard to keep it. At the time of her murder, she'd been living with Michael Kidney, with whom she had an on-again, off-again relationship for about a year. On September 26, 1888, it was off again after an argument she had with him and she went out to stay at a lodging house, something she did when they got into these spats. However, in order to do this, she needed to earn money to afford it. On the morning of September 29th, she was earning her keep at the lodging house by cleaning some of the rooms, but instead of using the money to pay for her room, she went out to have a drink. It seems as though alcohol abuse was also a commonality between all of Ripper's victims, but that's just speculation as well. After she drowned her sorrows in booze, she came back to the boarding house, borrowed some clothing, and went out for the night, presumably to make some more money. It was a stormy night when she hit the streets to conduct some business. Two people saw her at around 11 o'clock at night with a man standing in a doorway of a building. He was described, the man, was being described as five feet five inches tall and impeccably dressed. The two men even went on to say as a remark the leather apron this is the name of the newspapers gave to jack the ripper was wrapped around her since elizabeth and the man were kissing they seemed to look like they were in more of a spaddle after this she went off in embarrassment now she was seen once more by police constable william smith around 11:45 p.m he was on his normal beat for the night and uh, when he noticed a man and woman together in the same area where Elizabeth Stride's body would later be found. Smith described the man as being young, well-dressed, and around 5 feet 7 inches tall. The couple wasn't doing anything of suspicion at the time, so Smith continued on his patrol. Later that night, around 12.15 a.m., a man named Morris Eagle was walking his girl home from the gentleman's club in the area. But when he came back to the club at around 1 a.m. and walked through the yard where Stride's body was later found, at the time he said he didn't see anything on the ground because it was too dark. There's a possibility that he didn't notice anything, but he also said that he did not see anything on the ground or anyone in the area. A man named Israel Schwartz um, became an extremely important witness who said Elizabeth Stride Uh, He saw her around 30 minutes before her body was discovered. At around 12.45 a.m., about 15 minutes before Morris Eagle walked through the yard, he was was walking in Dutfield's yard, so this is the yard that we're talking about. He was walking in a small alleyway when he noticed a man walking in front of him. Said man stopped walking to converse with a woman, later identified as Elizabeth Stride. The only issue with Schwartz's statement was his story differed from time to time when he told it, but that possibly had something to do with the fact that he didn't speak English and had to have a translator provide his evidence to the authorities. Nevertheless, his words were valuable, if true, because he would have been the only person to witness one of Jack the Ripper's victims in their final moments, possibly with Jack himself. According to Schwartz, the man was about 5 feet 5 inches tall, about 30 years old, with dark hair and a broad build. He was also possibly slightly intoxicated. He appeared to be by the way he, by his mannerisms, the way he was walking and talking. As he watched from a distance, 
The man was violent with the woman, throwing her down onto the ground as she screamed three times, albeit not loudly. He thought it was nothing more than a domestic dispute and didn't want to get involved, so he carried on his way. As Schwartz did this, he saw another man in the area lighting a pipe. As he passed the man lighting the pipe, the other man who was hurting the woman called out Lipsky, leading the man with the pipe to begin following Schwartz. Alarmed at his new stalker, Schwartz did his best to lose the other man, which he did once he reached a railway. The other man was rather tall, Schwartz would say, standing at about 5 feet 11 inches and had light brown hair. This is strange because to this day, no one has figured out the significance to the second man or if the encounter was real at all. However, it's suggested from police reports the second man was tracked down and cleared of any wrongdoing. The validity of Schwartz's claims still raise questions for historians and true crime researchers. Until then, many people assumed Jack the Ripper worked alone. But since her body was discovered a mere 15 minutes after Schwartz's supposed encounter with the two men, it seems like too much of a coincidence for Stride to have been murdered by a second party. So around 1 a.m., a steward of the club in Dutfield's yard found Stride's body. He was trying to put his pony and cart away after spending the day and night selling cheap jewelry on the street, when the pony didn't want to go where he was leading it. He looked over to find the body of a woman, but only saw it for a split second as the wind extinguished his match. So he was using a match to light his way, but that wasn't enough. He couldn't be certain if it was his wife or not, the woman who was on the ground, so he ran inside to see if his wife was okay. Then, when he saw that his wife was safely inside the house, he got some other men to come out and check on the woman with him. Once he got a better source of light, a nice big candle, they, the group huddled around and were shocked to see the woman's throat slashed. In their mad dash to go find the police, they ran into police constable Edward Spooner. When Spooner got to the scene, he inspected the woman's body, lifting her chin to see if she was still alive. But then he saw the large gash in her throat. There was still blood leaking from the gash leaving them to determine her wounds were still fresh. Spooner noted her body was still warm as well, which led to the realization her murder wasn't that long ago. As the crowd grew, it got the attention of the police, who then ordered everyone to move away from the body while they got a doctor. So there were three police constables on scene at this point, including Spooner as one of them, and they were trying to control the scene. So when Dr. Blackwell, the doctor who came, arrived on the scene, he pronounced the woman dead. Obviously, she has a gash to her throat, a rather large gash to her throat, saying she'd been that way for about 20 to 30 minutes. While the doctor worked, the police gated up the area and ordered everyone to stay where they were. They went around checking people's hands and clothing for blood stains, as well as checking people's pockets and such. So they were trying to be a little more thorough this time around, which was smart on their part. At least the police were being more reasonable and uh, reliable. You know, I've talked about this time and time before during this case that they haven't really been the best at policing <laughs> up until this point. Having found nothing suspicious on the members of the crowd, the policemen also went around to residents in the area, so the little houses and cottages in the area, and woke up the inhabitants of the homes. However, they realized all of them were asleep at the time of the murder and did not want to worry them too much. So when, they, well, so when the people frighteningly asked the policeman who was questioning them what was wrong, the policeman responded with nothing much. Personally, this was a smart move because you don't want people panicking. It could possibly ruin any evidence in the area or alert the possibly nearby killer that you're on to them. Once an inspector was called to the scene, a more thorough examination was done as he collected the names and addresses of all the people present in the yard. After he was satisfied by their answers to any of his questions on their whereabouts, and they'd also emptied all their pockets for him to see if they had anything that was suspicious in them, he moved on. He also went around to the residents and searched their properties very thoroughly. For one fleeting moment, they assumed they'd found the killer 
hiding behind a locked loft door, but later found the room was empty once they'd broken into it. Once all the boxes and anything in the area had been checked for inspection the crime, from the crime scene, they carted the body to the morgue, and then someone washed the blood away at the very stroke of dawn that morning at 5 a.m. Someone washed the blood away from the crime scene. An interesting side note from the coroner's report is that Elizabeth Stride did not have anything removed from her body, only her throat was slashed. This is a drastic change from the previous two victims, especially considering the escalation with the removal of the womb in the previous killing. It's always strange when a killer changes their MO so drastically. The only excusal can, I can surmise from this is that the killer was interrupted before he could get into the main part of the ritual. All other factors of her being a victim of Jack the Ripper make sense. Her profession, where she lived, her cause of death being the slit throat, the time of day when she died, and the date and the time of the year. She is listed within the five for these reasons alone, even though there's still a possibility that she wasn't his victim. There's also the question of the weapon being a different size than the one used in the previous two killings. But the biggest factor that sticks out to me is the fact that she was not disemboweled. Her, the rest of her body was not mutilated in any way, and it seemed like his Jack the Ripper's Emma was growing as he went on from our first kill to our second. Because when he moved on to Annie Chapman, he was doing more. He was, he was taking the womb from the body after he had disemboweled. He was doing more to the body. He was doing more mutilation. It seemed like he was growing. But I can always chalk this up to the fact that her body was so fresh when it was found that he could have possibly heard the um, steward coming with his pony and realized that he did not have enough time to complete his ritual that he was planning on doing. So instead, he opted for just leaving her as she was because that's all he had time for. That's the only thing that really makes sense to me in that situation. And as for when I look back to Schwartz's interviews and Schwartz's comments and his um, witness statement, I really don't know if his statement is entirely true because I can never think about the fact that Jack the Ripper could have possibly had an accomplice. Unless he was some sort of apprentice that appreciated his work in some way, I really don't think that there would have been anyone at all working with him. So it makes absolutely no sense the things that Schwartz was saying during his time when talking to the police. He might have possibly seen something similar to what he said, but I do not think that he, and this is just my speculation personally, you can read up on this yourself if you want to, I do not think that he actually s witnessed any of the people who could have possibly murdered her. He might have been explaining it in the wrong way for the translator to translate for him, but I just, his story is just very strange to me and doesn't line up with anything else that we know about Jack the Ripper thus so far. So whatever the reasonings may be, Elizabeth Stride still holds the position of the third victim of the five. So guys, join me next week as I cover the fourth victim of the five. Thank you for listening to another episode of Coffee and Crime. I hope you come back next time. Until then.